have a, a VIP pass to the grand opening. Have you, have you worked on that for us yet? I hope so. I we'll hope do, so. We'll do a pincer movement. You, know, <laughs> you, you speak to the team, I'll speak to the team. We'll make sure that we're guests of honor at the grand opening. So I'm super excited today to be filming this installment of Maria Meets because I'm here with one of my favorite people in the world, not only one of the most amazing design partners to work with on the Royal Atlantis, but now also a dear friend, and it's Ellie Gamberg from KPF. Hey. So welcome to Maria Meets. You're one of, we, we, we're very, we're keeping it very select at the moment, so I think you're the third or fourth person that we've filmed with. But as you're here for a minute in Dubai, I couldn't let you go without doing a, an interview with you. So Any excuse to chat with you is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, you're getting on a plane tonight, right? So we've shoehorned this in. Yep, I have a 2.55 a.m. that gets me in at 8 a.m. before American Thanksgiving. Oh, making, happy make... Thanksgiving for tomorrow. Thank you. Um, but I did kind of lure you here to this venue because it's one of my favorites and one of your favorites. So we're in Nobu filming today because I knew if we picked Nobu, Ellie would definitely come. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, look, I know you super well now. We've had the privilege and pleasure of working together for five years, just over five years, I think, since we started about, the yeah. design work on the Royal Atlantis. Um, but for the benefit of everyone watching, tell us a little bit about you and what you do. My name is Ellie Gamberg, and I'm a design director at KPF, that's Cohen Patterson Fox. We're a global architecture firm based in New York City. And five and a half years ago or so now, we won a competition to do what is now called the Royal Atlantis, which is one of our most exciting projects. And it's been my privilege to, to work on that and, and be one of the leaders in the design team for that over the last, uh, the last few years. I think one of the first times that I met you, I'd probably only been working in Dubai for maybe two or three months and we actually flew over to your office in New York, mm -hmm. um, had the most amazing design team meeting, we had the interior designers from Paris, we had the landscape architects and, um, and uh, yeah I think that was one of the first times I met you and I knew that we'd just uh, not only be great colleagues and partners on this amazing icon but also um, you're just one of the warmest, kindest people um, I know so I just knew we'd get on from from day dot. Thank you very, very much. I have to say, actually, was, uh, your, your nose was probably itching earlier today because I was actually talking to some people about the fact that there are really two kinds of brokers in the world. Brokers that have actually vision to understand what a project can be and the ones that only sell off of precedent. And actually, we knew from the first meeting that you were somebody that had a lot of vision. So it's been a really great collaboration. Amazing. Thank you. I mean, well, look, we've, we've got an amazing project to collaborate on. Um, and that has been mainly down to you guys and your initial vision. Thank you. And I was talking to a colleague earlier actually, and we were saying, you know, there's always a story behind every iconic building. Um, well, every building probably in your case, but certainly for us, um, normally there's a story behind the vision of the initial design. Is there anything in particular when, when you guys were entering the design competition that, that you wanted to achieve with this or you wanted to focus on in particular? Yeah, when we were we were uh, contacted by the by the client, um, which was Kersner International, um, they said, "Well, you know, what we really want to do is build the most iconic building in Dubai," um, which is kind of a tall order because if you think about it, if there's any shape or form that you know of and can imagine, it's already built in Dubai or under construction at this moment. I mean, there are buildings that are spheres, teapots, spirals, twists, um, and so you know. Maybe it's a lack of inventiveness or our part, but we couldn't think of, of a shape or a form that hadn't been already done. Um, but we sort of took a step back and started to ask ourselves, what is it that people want about being in a place like Dubai? Mm -hmm. And really, ultimately, if we can create an iconic set of experiences that nobody's ever had before, then we create something truly, truly unique. And one of the great advantages of any city like Dubai that has the kind of mild annual climate of the city and the beachfront living and everything else is this idea of the indoor-outdoor lifestyle. And that's always encapsulated in people's minds by any of the great villas or houses that you see in Los Angeles or Ibiza yeah. or Miami. Um, but it's been very difficult over time to translate that into skyscrapers, into vertical living. So our thought was, what is it that we love about those sort of, you know, think of the Pierre Koenig houses on the, on the hills um, of Mulholland Drive overlooking Los Angeles, the pool, the, the sort of wraparound living space, the idea that you can just seamlessly move from indoors and outdoors. 
and how could we translate that into an entire skyscraper? Uh, and so we took a typical building, you know, very efficient layout in terms of apartments and hotels, and we split it apart to create these series of what we call sky courts. What that means is every hotel suite and every duplex or prime apartment has this amazing courtyard with swimming pool that allows you to have the experience of swimming underwater with this incredible view, 45 stories in the air over Dubai. Yeah. And luckily there, I can safely say that that's not ever been done. And just to put this into context, when we talk about these terraces, they are thousands of square feet. You know, this isn't just a small balcony or terrace area. Yeah. They are the most phenomenal terraces. Certainly, I don't think I, in 20 years, have seen anything like it in, in the whole of my career in real estate. Um, and they've been hugely popular with our clients. Um, and all our, our different, uh, you know, different nationalities, whether it's Middle Easterns or Europeans or Americans, everyone falls in love with those sky courts. So that vision back in the day five years ago has now translated into something that our buyers really, really yeah, want no, and, and value. Well, because if you think about it, aesthetics are different from place to place to place. But the sort of experiences of lifestyle as we sort of evolve I think are actually great commonalities. There's not a culture out there that doesn't have some form of a courtyard house or some form of, of, a, of, a, of a villa on the sea or a collective gathering space, you know, whether it's a piazza or a plaza uh, or, or a village court. And so if you, can, if you can build something around the shared collective experience of water, views, natural air, you create something that's going to attract anybody from, from wherever they are. And, and it's the proof is in the pudding because you know they're really abundantly popular with our clients. But actually, the the overall design of the building is so attractive. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I've been working on it with you for five years. But I'm very very passionate about design and and just development and construction. But I love 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 and everyone anyone that you know pays attention to my Instagram or has heard interviews that maybe we've done previously for for the media. I love like, the curvature of the building. I think that's like my favorite, favorite bit. Um, but one would assume, whilst it looks incredibly beautiful, it's hugely intrinsic from a design perspective to, to incorporate that into the building. So not only did you pull it apart, you also you know, put that beautiful curve in there. How, like, how did you do it? <laughs> it's, it's the question. Well, it's interesting. So we were, um, part of the reason I'm here right now is we're, we're visiting different parts of the building. We're reviewing, you know, materials and plans and, and just making sure the construction is sort of proceeding as we imagined and hoped that it would. And the good news is that it is. Um, but one of the areas we went to is um, some of the top floor residential units. And the way that the building uh, is designed is it does a sort of S-shaped curve. And that has two effects. All of the hotel rooms are basically concave towards all of the landscaping. And so for the hotel guests, they get to look down on the pools and the restaurants and kind of see all the activities of the resort and the lagoon and the palm and then Dubai Marina beyond. And then on the back side of the hotel where you're looking at the infinite horizon, the hotel curves out and so every room gets this incredible moment of, of serenity, privacy and the, you know, the infinite horizon. On the residential, the curve goes counter the other way. And so what that creates the effect of, because you're basically out on the palm, is almost all the residential units on both sides have this effect of being able to see the entire sweep of Dubai. And so, you know, there is really no other place in Dubai, or quite frankly, almost any coastal city, where you can be out looking back at the city skyline. And in the case of Dubai now, from the residential units, you can see literally from Dara all the way down to Marina Bay, the entire 180 degree expanse of the entire city. And so the curvature here is not just about how we sort of sit the building on the site and create different kinds of spaces on the ground level, but optimize views so that both the hotel and the residential have what is absolutely ideal and perfect for the needs of the users of those of those units. What I really love actually about the, the residential component is the feeling like you say, you're so connected to the city, you can see back to the city, but it feels so incredibly private at the same time. And I think from, from our perspective, that curve as well, you know, you, you don't feel like you've got a next door neighbor. Right. Because you know, it's almost like your own private view. You're hanging in midair and you can't see anybody next to you because the building's literally bent away. You also don't realize how big it is because the hotel, I mean, there's amazing moments where you kind of see the hotel, but the, the double curvature compresses the two pieces. So on the one hand, you think you're in a single tower and then you take a step back and realize you're in this sort of very expansive thing. I was, I was talking to one of our colleagues from New York yesterday um, that you know very well, from one of our colleagues from Douglas Elliman, um, and we were talking about the fact that obviously, whether it be London or New York, you know, they still have to go up 
X amount of stories and um, he just couldn't believe the sheer scale of the Royal Atlantis. I said, well, we're still blessed with sand, you know, we're still <laughs> blessed with space. We can go outwards as well as upwards. Um, but I, I think that's something that makes um, the development very unique for Dubai is that we've actually sort of looked at not just a vertical building, but, you know, how that looks horizontally um, rather than just being another skyscraper. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's been so well received by our clients. I, for one, just can't wait until it's finished. I'm very much looking forward to next year. <laughs> Neither can I. I don't yeah. think there's anybody who doesn't want it to be done at this point. I know. I think it's, it's been such a labor of love. And, and that's the great thing. Everyone that's worked on this project has worked as one design team for the last five years. Um, and that's really rare in our industry, I think, that you, you get people that start from the conception all the way through to the completion. Um, and we've been very fortunate in that respect. And I get to work with Lisa, so. Um, it's it's, it's been an incredible, incredible amount of fun. Yeah. I mean, we've had, some, um, we've had some fun times as well, working together on the project. So one of my fondest memories was when we, um, we did a series of events in the US Recall when we did uh, like a panel dis discussion Q and A with all the experts that have been involved, but I somehow convinced you guys to work with us on these three events, but failed to probably mention that they would be three events in two and a half days, and I was going to fly you from New York to Miami to LA. But at least at the end of it, we you know we got to have a, a bit of R and R gin and tonic. You know I love a gin and tonic, um, and it was just great spending time with you all. I mean you know I think that's something that I love about what we do is that it doesn't matter if you're the architect or the real estate consultant or the interior designer, you know, we do get to travel the world together and, and work super close. Well, and it's been, a, I mean, an amazing, amazing team. And we, we should mention that they're, you know, the client team is rather extensive because there's sort of hotel and residential. It's been an incredible collaboration between Curzon International and Investment Corporation of Dubai. At the same time, they've sort of pulled together a world-class group of, of designers. So we actually have two landscape designers um, that are both absolutely phenomenal. Uh, SKS and, and 40 North. Um, the interior designers, you know, I, I mean, GA Design, the, the full design leadership of that of that office has become dear friends, Sybil de Marjorie from Paris. Um, and then even, you know, down to the restaurant designers, um, you know, Jeffrey Beers is just a terrific firm from New York. We've collaborated with them a lot. Um, and each of the other restaurants has their own unique designers from Australia to Spain to Germany. It's really been an incredible amalgam. I mean, I'm not allowed to have favorites, but it's, this is Maroon Meats, then I suppose I can say it. Um, but I clearly I love Nobu, um, the venue we've chosen for today's filming. And I think that's great for our clients as well, because they have access to all the amazing restaurants in the Atlantis as well as the Royal Atlantis. Um, but I was with the team from uh, dinner by Hess and Blumenthal last Friday. I was in London and had a quick meeting with them. And even them talking about their designs for the restaurant, I mean, it blew my mind. So I can't wait to see it in real life. But surely we've been working on it for so long, we're going to have a, a VIP pass to the grand opening. Have you, have you worked on that for us yet? I hope so. I we'll hope do, so. We'll do a pincer movement. You, know, <laughs> you, you speak to the team, I'll speak to the team. We'll make sure that we're guests of honor at the grand opening. That should be the celebration for like the 50th Maria Meets. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's a good idea, actually. I'm going to. I, I'll edit that out. I'll pretend it was my own idea. <laughs> um, coming back to you a little bit. So, you know, your work speaks for itself. Um, you are one of the most well-respected architects globally, and KPF is such a fantastic um, company across all the key cities. Um, you know, pick a city and, and you've definitely done something there. So, work aside, um, we get to travel to some of the most amazing cities. But if you had to pick one to visit and sightsee or the museums or the architecture, um, what global city would you pick and why? Well, I'm totally gonna cheat in my answer. And I think the thing that I love about the world today and also about the work that we do is the fact that I don't have to pick. And the way that, 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 that the world is today, you know, we can be in London one month, we can be in Rome the next, Paris, Hong Kong, Mumbai, India, Dubai, yeah. Shanghai, and you know the way I always think about it is these cities are my friends, and it's not just because I have good friends in each one of these places and people I've known from from university all the way you know earlier high school to people we've met professionally, 
but because each one of these cities has slightly different characters. And so it literally comes to this moment where you kind of come off the plane and you remember you know, your favorite Li Long in Shanghai that has your absolute best cup of coffee in that city or the absolutely most astonishing little street of art galleries in, in the Marais in Paris. Uh, or a place that I used to live when I was when I was you know studying in Rome. So in the end, it's the fact that I can keep coming and seeing old friends. It's like asking a question: Which is your favorite best friend? It's actually like spending time with all of them. Well, of course, that goes without saying. <laughs> um, well, you know that London has a dear um, place in my heart because obviously I lived there for so many years, and you lived in London for, for a while, right? I, I couldn't London. get out of my system. I've lived yeah. it on three separate occasions. What's um What's one of your favorite buildings in London? Because it's only since I've moved away that now I really appreciate the architecture when I go back. Is there a particular style or a building that... Well, what I love about, you know, it, it's really, really funny because they're actually, London, I think, is one of the world's great cities architecturally, but I actually think that my favorite building or set of buildings in London are just the row houses you get on the sort of mews and, yeah. and side streets of any of the great neighborhoods, whether it's sort of Bayswater or Kensington or Chelsea. And there's, you know, there, there's something that's always talked about in terms of like, you know, doing things that are very different and very unique. But some of the most beautiful neighborhoods in London are the one where they just have sort of one type of house and they repeat it, you know, 10, 12, 20 times with a little bit of a different window, a little bit different color, a little bit of a different sort of portico. And there's something so beautiful about seeing that kind of almost like a Warhol set of Campbell soup cans of these beautiful houses around a simple little garden. Exactly, and just on a, on a simple day, and it doesn't matter whether it's a London winter or a London summer, because they kind of look the same. Um, the <laughs> they're same temperature. Same temperature. <laughs> That's for sure. It's, it's just, it, you know, in, in certain ways, I think whenever we kind of try to create new moments of urbanism or architecture, in some ways we almost want to sort of measure it against the yardstick of, if you think of a great neighborhood in London, does what we do hold up against that today? Do you know, that really resonates with me, actually, because I was just back there last week, and I found myself, whilst I had a hugely hectic schedule, I found myself walking to, uh, between meetings, which is rare for me, because in yeah. Dubai, I don't think I walk anywhere. Um, but I was sort of getting a bit lost. You know, I, I actually calmed down for a minute. And it, it was almost like the serenity of, the, of, of those side streets and, and just appreciating what was around me. I think all the world's great cities encourage a certain amount of walking. Like my, my, my favorite thing to do in London, first of all, I walk everywhere. But if I have even a moment of time, even late in the evenings, is try to walk from the city all the way across London as far as I can go to some random direction. So I've gone, you know, from from sort of Farringdon Station all the way to Holland Park, or I've gone from you know Camden all the way down to Elephant and Castle. And the number of different things you can see walking across, and, and I, I think the same thing going in Shanghai, walk all the way from the Bund towards sort of like Wheelock Square or Jinan Sculpture Park, or, or I've actually been the fool to walk from, from Dara to Marina in Dubai, and it is actually possible, and it's, it's amazing to see what you cross along the way. Yeah, and that's the thing, I think as well that we can get so caught up with, you know, being on our phones or, you know, walking from meeting to meeting. Um, but you've got to look up and see what's around you, right? But I, that's, that's your world. <laughs> yeah, but and, and, and what great cities, great neighborhoods, great buildings do is create the kinds of experiences that are not reproducible in one image or even a video. Like someplace you have to, when, when a friend comes back from someplace and says, I would show you a picture, but you've just got to be there to experience it, you know you found a great place. Exactly. And you're probably responsible for designing some of the most amazing buildings in all these cities that we go to, so thank you. Um, I mean, it has been such a pleasure. I'm so glad I managed to catch him for all of a New York minute um, before he flew back uh, this evening. But thank you so much, Ellie. Um, I always love seeing you. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, and now we'll move on to our uh, next pleasure. We'll, we'll stop rolling. Um, and, uh, yeah, have a quick catch-up before you have to go and get that flight. Well, cheers. 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 Now we've got all sorts of different stories where we've, we've had a great time. I'm not sure I can share them all here, but yeah, actually, uh, they've I've... involved some late nights and, and a lot of amazing cities.